Is this lens the best landscape photography lens that Nikon produce? Let's talk about it. Afternoon folks, welcome back. Something a little bit different for you today. I don't normally do gear reviews and that sort of thing, but the fact I'm doing this uh, video today kind of tells you uh, what I think of this piece of kit. Now this is the Nikon Z 24 to 200 millimeter for Z mount. Um, and really for the, I'd say in the last five or six years, this has been the most impressive piece of kit that I think I've bought. Uh, so I'm going to go into a little bit of the reasons why I use this lens, why maybe you as a landscape photographer should consider this lens as well if you're in the Nikon Z system. And uh, we're also going to do a little bit of an interesting comparison uh, in this video towards the end. That's going to be this lens against the uh, 70 to 200 millimeter 2.8, which to all intents and purposes should knock this out of the park. But as you'll see in my test, the results are more than a bit surprising. So, uh, so yeah, anyway, let's get into this. Okay, so what is this lens? This would normally in the past be considered something of a do it all, jack of all trades, walk about, travel sort of lens. And I would have normally steered clear of these type of lenses in the past certainly on the older dslr mounts uh, because you were giving up a fair bit of optical quality uh, even though you did have that great versatility this this lens obviously covers a wide focal length of 24 millimeter to 200 so fairly wide angle to telephoto basically uh, it's pretty compact nice and light it's about 570 grams give or take uh, it has five stops of vibration reduction built into it. So when you pair that with the IBIS in the camera, it's a pretty potent combination for shooting a handheld with. Uh, and it's also weather sealed, which is uh, which is really good. And I've, I've certainly put this lens to the test in that department. But also I think it's important to discuss why I use this lens and how I actually ended up with it. So... Really for that, you've got to go back to October 2020, so about two and a half years ago now, uh, when I first moved into the Nikon Z system. And back then when I bought this lens, there was not very many options for landscape photographers in terms of the telephoto end of things. So you basically were faced with a choice of getting this lens or the 70 to 200 2.8, which I decided against because I thought, the 2.8 and the heavy glass is probably a bit of overkill for landscape photography, to be honest. And I'd far rather have the weight savings than the marginal increase in image quality that I was going to get. But I was still a little sceptical of this lens because it being a travel sort of lens, uh, would it be up to the task of producing the type of images that I need to sell in a gallery in a professional environment? So I did a lot of uh, research on this lens, looked on YouTube and other places for reviews and the feedback that I, I could see was very positive. So I took the plunge and, uh, and got the lens and two and a half years on, I, I couldn't be happier with it to be honest. It's, it's still in great nick and I would say, it's not an overstatement to say pretty much all of my favourite images that I've taken in the past couple of years have all been taken on this lens. So I think that's a pretty good segue to discuss some of the images that I've made with it and also my style of shooting. So in terms of my landscape photography, I'm based in the Lake District, which is uh, 
for people outside the UK watching this, this is a big uh, national park, one of the most picturesque areas of the, the UK. Big wide open spaces and mountain sort of vista stuff. So I'd say the majority of my photography is spent shooting those types of scenes. Now, that's not to say that I shoot them ultra wide because I shoot a good focal length range. I tend to sort of spread my images across, you know, anywhere between well, 24 and 200 millimeter, basically. Um, but I don't tend to shoot things ultra wide that often unless I absolutely have to or the, the scene compels me to. So this, this lens really sort of covers everything that I need in that sense. Um, but the, the question for me has always been, will it stand up in terms of image quality? Because for what I do as a prof professional and the fact that I run a gallery and I basically live and die on whether I can sell my images as prints, I really wouldn't put this, put this in my bag unless it wasn't up to the task. So we'll go through a couple of images anyway. So this first one on the screen, this is a really good example of how versatile this lens is because this was taken at a Sint in uh, Scotland, Clackdall Beach. And when I got down to the, the shoreline here to take these shots, uh, it was absolutely blown a gale, 40, 50 miles an hour wind, driving rain and hailstones, just really bad weather basically. And when I got down there, I'd forgot that I'd actually put this lens on the, um, well, I'd left the lens on the camera. And the, the weather conditions meant that if I tried to sort of change lenses, there was a real risk that I could damage the equipment. So I ended up leaving this on the camera and shooting it at a focal length, which to all intents and purposes, is probably the, the weakest part of this lens, the wide end. So this image was shot at 24 millimeters. Now, if you look at this image in the corner areas, this is where you would expect this, this lens to sort of fall down a little bit at the wide end. But when you look at this image, I'm not really seeing any major sort of degradation or softness in the, in the image. Now, I've seen a lot of other YouTubers commenting on this uh, lens at the wide end of things and saying you know it's a little bit weak and yeah I mean if if you were to look at MTF charts and stuff like that then it, it probably is not the sharpest area of this lens but it's still more than good enough and in this instance here if I didn't shoot with this lens I wouldn't have got the shock because there was no way I was going to be able to change lenses safely in that kind of wind and rain. So if you're giving me the option of a tiny little drop in image quality at the wide end versus actually getting the shot, then I'll take getting the shot every time. And I think you'd agree that this shot has come out pretty well and uh, taken at the weakest end of this lens, which, which isn't bad at all, really. This next image, this is, well, another good example of how well this, this lens stands up in the uh, in the weather. I mentioned earlier that it's weather sealed and on this shoot I was out shooting in a blizzard and really again trying to change lenses would have been an absolute nightmare. Freezing fingers, driving snow, a bit windy, just the last thing you want to be doing in those conditions is f you know faffing around and changing lenses. So everything that I shot that, that uh, day was off this lens and it was such a godsend to, to be able to shoot such a wide focal range and not have to keep changing the lenses out. Um, this image here, this is one of my favourite images that I've ever taken. Uh, it went on to be commended in Landscape Photography of the Year. And yeah, just testament to, to really how good this lens is. Uh, I think if I'd also tried to change lenses while these ponies were under the the trees there I might have missed the shot completely again so yeah another another big win for this lens um, yeah couldn't have been happier with it on that shoot and uh, yeah well worth the uh, the money that day this third image that I'm going to show you this is it's either the joint my joint favorite or my second favorite image that I've ever shot in my life and um, once again shot with this lens and once again, one of those situations where really, really extreme weather, I think it was like minus seven or minus eight when I was shooting these images, 
fingers frozen again. <laughs> Didn't want to have to be faffing around changing lenses. And yeah, shot everything again that morning with just the one lens. And knowing that because I was in a woodland, most of the shots that I was taking were from 50 millimeter and beyond. That's where this lens really excels. It's uh, from about 40 millimeter onwards, I would say it's, it's absolutely tack sharp. And you can see by this image, if you, we have a, a little bit of a scan around the image in the corners, you can see that really there isn't any sort of drop off here in image quality. So if you're shooting in a woodland environment like that, at sort of F 7.1, F8, that sort of range, and about 50 millimeter onwards, this is absolutely fine. It's brilliant, to be honest with you. And once again, you know, I'm not sure I'd have got this image um, if I didn't have this lens with me. So, uh, so yeah, definitely one of my favorite images that I've ever produced. And uh, another big tick in the box for this lens. I think what would be helpful here is if we have a look at this under a bit more scrutiny because it's all well and good me giving you sort of anecdotal um, chat about this lens. Uh, I've showed you a few examples there of what it's capable of, but let's sort of geek out a little bit and get into the nitty gritty. So we'll put this up against the Nikon uh, Z70-200mm uh, to 2.8 which is the flagship telephoto lens uh, for the Nikon range. And at two and a half thousand pounds should outperform this lens comfortably. So we'll go back to last year when I, uh, when I shot this little bit of footage and we'll have a look at these, these two lenses. I shot these images, three different focal lengths at three different apertures to be completely transparent and fair under flat as a pancake lighting so no real sort of dynamic range issues or anything like that it's as it's as fair and level a test as as you can really get of these two lenses so anyway let's get into that okay so on the screen we've got a series of images from the test that i took last year on the way home from harris this is the Classic view of the little white cottage underneath uh, Buccaletive Moor, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a, a really bare bones test of the, the, the lens sharpness, if you like. Um, three different focal lengths at two different apertures. So first set are wide open, and then the second set, a stop down to f8, which is really where these two lenses should be performing at the best. Now, I'm not going to go through every single image because it'll take me all night. Uh, but I'm just going to pick out a couple of examples here to show you that uh, that will give you a better idea of how these two lenses perform against each other. So if we start with the two lenses wide open at 70 millimeter, we'll bring these up on the screen here. We've got the 24 to 200 millimeter on the left and the 70 to 200 2.8 on the right. Uh, if we zoom in to 100% on the cottage, so you can see on the right that the 70 to 200 2.8 is doing a little bit of a better job uh, in terms of sharpness and contrast, but you would expect that. But at 100%, there certainly isn't a night and day difference between these two. The one on the right is marginally better, I would say, but it's not hugely noticeable at 100%. Now, if I zoom in at 300% and go in on this fence next to the cottage, you can start to see where the 70 to 200 is outperforming. But it, again, it's not a huge difference. It's, you know, it's marginal at best, I would say. And uh, if we just go into the corner of the image at 100%, if we go up into this corner here, you can see again that the 70 to 200 is doing a little bit of a better job, both on contrast and sharpness. I would say more on the contrast front than the sharpness, to be honest with you. Um, but again, they're pretty comparable. Now, you would expect the... 24 to 200 at f6 to be doing maybe even slightly better because the 70 to 200 is wide open uh, but 
they're pretty similar on the screen here anyway but we'll pick up on another example so now we have the two lenses wide open again this time at about 130 millimeter i've tried to keep the perspectives as close as i can the one on the right is shown 135 but they're, they're pretty much identical to be honest now as the 24 to 200 is variable aperture wide open for that lens is f6.3 whereas obviously for the constant aperture uh, 70 to 200 that's 2.8 uh, if we zoom in again on the house you can see similarly again the 70 to 200 is slightly ahead on contrast and sharpness but it's not a huge difference uh, you can see the one on the right is a little bit brighter as well that could be just to do with the uh, the lighting conditions overhead changing slightly if we just move across to the fence again you can see here that the 70 to 200 is, is doing a much better job here in the middle but if we go up to the corners you can start to see that the 24 to 200 is catching up a little bit uh, but as I say, the caveat here is that the 70 to 200 is wide open. You would expect it to improve significantly, especially in the corners uh, when it stopped down to f8. But uh, again, pretty comparable both on contrast and sharpness here. Now, this next example, this is the one that really surprised me. So we're at f8 now on both lenses at roughly 130 millimeter. I would expect the 70 to 200 on the right to be significantly outperforming the 24 to 200 on the left. But if we zoom in, this result actually shocked me. The 24 to 200 on the left, to my eye at 100% there, is actually sharper. So much so that I actually was doubting myself that there was maybe a focusing issue here, but... I don't think it is. I think it is just that at f8, the 24 to 200 millimeter, 130 uh, millimeter is actually a little bit sharper, which is crazy to think about. But if you look at this fence line, you can see that it's actually starting to outperform the uh, the more expensive lens. And if we go up into the corners at 100 percent, they're pretty much on par with each other again. So really, this is a bit of a, a bit of a shocker to be honest. You can see in the other corner that the seventy to two hundred has got a little bit more contrast, but I certainly wouldn't say it's sharper in the corners. I'd say that they're pretty much neck and neck here. Um, but in the center, when we go in a little further at three hundred percent, you can see that the the detail on the roof on the twenty four to two hundred is a fair bit sharper which is uh which is really surprising so yeah we can chalk that up as a as a win for the less expensive lens there which uh yeah is a bit of a shocker and this last one on the screen just quickly here we're now at 200 millimeter all the way in on both lenses and we're at f8 again for both lenses if we go in at well we'll, we'll start at 100 percent you can see that the 70 to 200 on the right has just pulled ahead again a little bit, uh, both in contrast and sharpness. It's it's a little bit ahead, but it's not miles ahead, I wouldn't say. Uh, I'm certainly not trying to come across as biased here. I'm actually really quite surprised how, how close these two lenses are when you, you put them under scrutiny like this. If we just move across to the, the fence line, you can see that the 70 to 200 is doing a little bit of a better job uh, resolving some of the fine details around uh, the tree branches here and the, the fence line itself. Uh, you can see in this uh, fir tree that the, the details are becoming a little bit mushy on the 24 to 200. But it should be remembered that, again, we're all the way in at 100% here and there's not an awful lot between them. If we just go up into the corner... You can see that the 70 to 200 is significantly more contrasty, I would say. Sharpness wise, they look about the same, to be honest. I'd say the 70 to 200 is, is a hair sharper, but 
really I'm noticing more of a difference in the contrast than anything else. But if you're looking at these side by side at 100% uh, to the naked eye, there's not an awful lot of difference. It should be remembered that the lens on the right, the 70 to 200, is three times the cost of the one on the left. And it's also about twice, two and a half times the weight possibly. So just if you're thinking about picking up this 24 to 200 lens, this test hopefully shows you that the differences between this and you know the top of the line 70 to 200 is I would say marginal at best and in some instances like we've just shown you there at 130 mil the 24 to 200 is actually outperforming uh, the more expensive lens which is a real shocker to be honest um, but all in all this kind of indicates my decision to not buy the 70 to 200 millimeter because I feel like I'd be spending an awful lot of extra money for a very marginal gain in performance. So for me personally, my approach to landscape photography and for my own shooting, I'd much rather have the weight savings and the flexibility than the added cost and for the very minor increase in image quality. So hopefully you found that little test useful. We'll get back to the video. So you've seen there the uh, images under close scrutiny. Uh, I think, like me, you were probably a little bit surprised by the results there. Uh, I was expecting the 70 to 200 to, to comfortably outperform this, but in, in actual real world use and at two, 300% in Lightroom, you're not really seeing an awful lot of difference, especially, well, at F8 anyway, which is the majority of where a lot of your shots in landscape are going to be, F8 and beyond. Um, but we should talk about the negatives of this lens because it does have a, a couple. Uh, the variable aperture straight away is one. So if you're a shooter that likes to shoot handheld in low light, then that variable aperture, the longer end of the, the focal range, may be a little bit of a hindrance to you. Uh, so again, depends on your shooting style for me personally. I do shoot a bit of handheld, but I'd say probably 70% of my work is off a tripod. So it's not that big of a deal for me. And also when you consider the fact that this has got VR in the lens and IBIS in the body, I can still shoot at pretty slow shutter speeds, even in low light, even if uh, we're down at 6.3 on the end of the variable aperture. So horses for courses on that uh, front. But yeah, the variable aperture may be uh, something that you'd, you'd want to consider if you were thinking about buying this. Um, the next point is something that I touched on earlier, it is a little weak at the wide end. Now, in a pinch, as I showed with that image from Clackdoll, it's not a problem, to be honest with you. Is it as sharp as my dedicated wide angle? No. But then for my use case, I shoot with the 14 to 30 f4, and then anything from 30 millimeter and beyond, I'll use this. So if I've got the choice of shooting, at 24mm I'll always shoot with the dedicated wide lens but I've absolutely no issues with shooting with this if, if I had to at 24mm it's not a problem but when people say that this is weak at the wide end you've got to take that in the context of it's up against some absolutely amazing other glass in the Z-mount system and they're all absolute stellar performers so if you know Compared to some of those lenses, it is a little softer at the wide end, but it's still very, very good. So, you know, again, make of that what you will. But in summary, I would say this really, if, if you're a landscape photographer in the in the Z-mount system or considering moving, and you're a bit on the fence as to what to buy at the longer end of things, I think this is a really good option. If you don't find that you shoot a lot of images at shallower depths of field so if if you're like me and the majority of your, sh your shots are taken from sort of f8 and, and onwards then really for me uh, this is absolutely excellent and for my use case personally i'd far rather have the flexibility of the zoom range than perhaps say for example the 24 to 120 which is an absolute stellar performer but in terms of image quality it's, you know, it's it's not going to be leaps and bounds past this. It may be a little better across the, the range, but 
I'd rather have, rather have that extra 80 millimeter in my bag uh, at the longer end than perhaps have the one the 24 to 120 and have to carry three lenses around so really I have considered that 24 to 120 millimeter but um, really I keep coming back to this lens and seeing well where's the the use case for it I just I just can't see it personally now my decision might have been influenced a bit more if that lens had been out at the time that I bought this um, but even still I still think I might have might have bought this anyway uh, I may pick up the 24 to 120 at some point in the future but for now this is every time I consider it I look at the results that I get off this and I, I can't see any real point in uh, in selling it so I'm going to continue to shoot with this lens for the foreseeable really i do have the 100 to 400 millimeter for that extra reach as well but uh, for 90 percent of my shooting i can go out with two lenses and get the job done to a a satisfactory level that uh, that i'm happy with and you've seen in these examples that um you know those have been printed up to pretty large sizes and they're absolutely fine to me so i've no qualms on that front now at some point I probably will do a comparison with this lens and the 24 to 120. Uh, I'm actually in Lofoten in a couple of weeks with uh, my friend Dem again and he's got the 24 to 120 so we may do a little test of this against it. Um, but my advice to anyone watching this video if, you, if you're looking at these Nikon Z lenses is that they're all absolutely stellar quality, they're, they're just fantastic glass and um, really whatever lens you get you're going to be happy with the results if you if you're going to start looking at charts and you know mtf charts and you know brick wall tests and stuff like that really you know you can agonize till the cows come home ultimately what i would say is pick up the lenses that suit your style of shooting first and foremost and whatever you do with these lenses you're going to be in safe hands with them because they're absolutely top quality. So if you've got any questions about this lens, do leave me a, a comment and uh, I always try to answer all the comments and um, hopefully this has been of use to you and some help. Uh, the next video, I'm going to try and squeeze another video in before I go to Lofoten and then once I'm over there, I'm going to try and get two and three, two or three videos filmed as well. So really looking forward to that trip. But anyway, until the next time, I'll catch you later.